Regarding the greater exodus, is it possible that the obedience of the sacrifices is one of the mechanisms that will reconcile Ephraim and Yehuda down the road, referencing the eventual temple? I don't know where the eventual temple or whatever they start doing, where that fits into things yet. I do know that that's got to happen before, you know, anything else that we're worried about happening. So I would be much more looking uh, to see when they start the put the altar back up and start doing sacrifices more than I'd be looking for blood moons and all those other signs. Okay, because that is likely to be, well, I, I fully expect that they're going to start that. Okay, and so when that starts, then we know we're going to be really close to what's going on as opposed to trying to look at all these other external things like signs in the heavens and, you know, this thing's in the constellation of that or this thing's in the that. You know what, let's, let's look to the things that are easier to look at, which is until they really start either rebuilding the temple or at least starting the sacrifices by putting the altar back up or whatever, we're not there yet. Okay, that's something that's, that's got to happen and come. But what is your understanding of the second exodus? What is my understanding of the second exodus? Um, that's got a lot to it, I'm supposing. I mean, I believe it's going to be a lot like the first exodus. Okay, that's why he gives us the account of the first exodus, that it's a type and shadow type of thing. I know that there are people out there that do a lot of teaching about the second exodus. I do not at this point. Um, I may at some point teach a little bit. Uh, the Millennium and Kingdom teaches, teaching does touch on it, I believe. Also, I did a two-part series uh, called Leaving Egypt, okay? Um, one was Passing Through the Waters, and the other was The Forever Kingdom, or something about The Forever Kingdom. So you may want to listen to those. I think those dealt quite a bit with the second exodus. Isaiah 11.10 says, Yahweh stands as a banner the second time. Is the first time in Numbers 2 when the tribes and foreigners are assemblies? And she also has, or refers to Song of Solomon's 2-4. Okay, when he, sends up, when he sends up the banner in 10 of 11, he says, you know, he says that a um, uh, second time, he, he talks about recovering the remnant. Okay, recovering the remnant. Which is why I'm thinking it's not saying Egypt as the first one because it has to do with recovering the remnant a second time. So he's going to recover the remnant, and then in the millennium, there'll be more recovering of a remnant. And so I just see that as being possibly the connection there with the remnant, okay? Um, again, it's a prophecy that's written in Isaiah that is just what we have is what we have. That's all the information he gave us. And so we're basically cause, causes us to speculate on, you know, on whatever level we decide we want to speculate. And uh, so as far as... Um, we're stuck with the words. He says, in that day, Yahweh sets his hand again a second time to recover the remnant. And that's right after he said Yeshua, or he said he would have a banner to, for the people unto whom the Gentiles shall seek. All right, so you can see that happening now, and you can see that happening again during the millennium. And so, you know, these things to me play out that way. Can there also be a reference to this back to Egypt as well? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we don't have to think linearly. As a matter of fact, we get in trouble if we only think linearly trying to understand the scriptures. It's more cyclical. It's more layered. It's more multiple fulfillments pointing to an ultimate fulfillment. Um, look, Isaiah chapter 11 is also talking about, um, you know, uh, Hezekiah. Okay. I mean, there's verses here that refer to Hezekiah. There's also verses that we see uh, in, that, that are talking about the one right, you know, judging righteously and everything else, pointing to ones that actually were in that day, that came soon after. So again, it's layers. It's not one or the other. It's both. You know, a lot of times the answer in Hebraic thought is not either or, but both or and. <laughs> Referring to the ten men in the tzitzit, can a minion be connected? Also, will those Jews that we will be connecting to have the testimony of Yeshua? Okay, good questions. So, um, is there a connection to a minion? Um, I don't know exactly what started the idea of the minion. Um, I guess I could do some research and find it out. I mean, of course, you have the lowest denomination was the heads of tens. And so a group of 10 was considered necessary to be considered a complete group to do a prayer service. And so the Jewish community calls that a minion, to have a minion to, so that they can actually uh, perform a service. Without 10, you can't do it. Um, of course, the 10 is always pointing to the lost tribes, always to the separated brothers. 
uh, the scattered and, you know, and, and disconnected. Um, so is there a reference that connects to Minion? Maybe. Again, it's not an either or. It's probably an and or possible connection there. You know, the numbers are to always remind us of all the things that the numbers remind us of. So we think of 10, we should think of lost tribe, think of 10 commandments, we think of, so the 10 are seeking the commandments and grabbing the kanaf, we think of the corners of the seat seat and what they point to. Everything is connected. So if we are making connections because it's being stirred up, there probably is some connection there. I'm not sure really to what degree. Okay, so are the Jews who are being, the seat seat are being grabbed, are those with the testimony of Yeshua? It doesn't say. Okay, but we can assume that if it's in that day, this is going to be Jews that are believers who, have, who says Elohim is with you. So yes, so if it's in that day, in that point, we're talking about Jewish believers. I was just making the point that at this point, let's not harass Judah who has got their deliverances of the Jews, etc. first, and all those other verses. What are your thoughts on why Manasseh is on the gate in New Jerusalem and Ephraim is not? In, in Revelation or in the actual gates in Jerusalem now? Well, it says New Jerusalem, but it's not referring to, to any verse. Sounds like uh, Revelation. Hold on. Well, the New Jerusalem, Revelation 21, just says that it's the 12 tribes. It doesn't list them by name in Revelation 21. The uh, place that you may be referring to may be in... Um, in Revelation 7, in the 144,000. So that's what I'm guessing that you are referring to. Because in that, you see Manasseh and you see Yosef, and Yosef is Ephraim. So you don't see, you don't see, you see Manasseh listed and you see Yosef listed. Well, Yosef is listed as Ephraim. And so you get a double portion for Joseph in there. I'm not seeing the names of the 12 gates. Is there another verse somewhere that I'm missing? Where the 12, the names of the 12 gates of the 12, it just says they're the 12 tribes. Yeah, I don't see any follow up here. Okay. So I'm guessing that it's because in Revelation 7, it lists, it lists Manasseh and it doesn't list Ephraim. Okay. When it talks about the 144,000. But it does list Ephraim. Remember, Ephraim and Yosef are synonymous. And it lists Yosef, it doesn't list Ephraim. So you have Ephraim listed there. Okay, and Manasseh is stuck in for a double portion, and Dan is the one that's missing. And we know that Dan is where they set up the pagan altars, and they set, changed the feasts uh, during the time of uh, Jeroboam taking the ten tribes north. So we can assume that that had something to do with why Dan is missing out of the list. Can you please expound upon Malachi 4 to how it is linked to Matthew 9 and the use of the word son? It's spelled S-U-N. Okay, I'm not sure that has anything to do with the teaching today. Malachi 4.2. Four, 4.2, two. Four, two. and then where? Uh, how it's linked to Matthew 9. And then Matthew, oh, with, oh, the Matthew 9 thing? Yep. Okay, so let me get to Malachi first. Malachi 4.2, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise, shall rise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and leave for joy. So Malachi 2 is talking about the idea of a great light. He says, for those who fear my name, the great light of righteousness shall rise. Shall arise. So we know that Yeshua is the light, the light of the world. Okay. And so, and the other one was then with what? Matthew? Matthew 9. Matthew 9, the verses I read? Correct. Well, I'm not supposed to, it just says the use of the word son, so that's in there. Okay, I'm trying, where's the word son? I didn't remember reading that in... Matthew 9. Okay, I'm not seeing the word son in Matthew 9, so if it's there, I'm missing it, but it's not in the verses I read. Can you um, bring some more clarity regarding the new covenant with Jeremiah and Hebrews? And is, uh, is this referring to the new covenant that is yet to come? Okay. Um, I, I don't necessarily look at or consider the Matthew through Revelation the new covenant. I'm just saying that's where the term comes from, that a publisher, however many hundreds of years ago, decided to arbitrarily stick that page in between the Old and the New Testaments to call them old and new, okay? That was a man-made decision, all right? And so 
I was simply pointing out that that's where the term comes from, is from the phrase in Jeremiah 31, 31, when he says, and I shall make a new, and the Hebrew says, a Brit Chadashah. Okay? Now, in Hebrews, what, 12, 24, okay, so it says, and to Yeshua, the mediator of a new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling, which speaks better than the blood of Hevel. Okay. I'm going to have to go back and get the whole context of what the writer of Hebrews is getting at here. So, okay. So he's, he's, he's trying to give a distinction here about, <coughs> excuse me, well, there's a lot of stuff going on here in chapter 12. But the point he's trying to make, he said, look, it, it begins in uh, verse 22. said, but you have drawn near to the Mount Zion and to the city of the living, living Elohim, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of messengers, to the entire gathering and assembly of the firstborn. Okay, you've drawn near to that group. Not actually literally physically done that, okay? Because we're talking about angels. We're talking about, you know, the messengers, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now you now actually, now what you've done is you are now that much closer to these things. And including being that much closer to Yeshua, who is the mediator of that covenant that's to come. Okay, you've gone closer to the new Jerusalem, the new, the heavenly, it says here, the, it says the heavenly Jerusalem, you're now, you're, you're, you're closer to it than you were before. But you don't see it. You're not touching it. It's not actually physically like you actually walked closer to it. It's not like you took a few steps and you're actually physically closer to it. As a matter of fact, it doesn't show up till Revelation 21. Okay? Okay, when everything's been burned up in a brand new earth, a brand new heavens, a brand new everything. So he says, but you have drawn near to Mount Zion and the city. Why? Because you have made decisions, he says, that are different than Esau's decision. If you go back to verse 16. You've made decisions to draw near. He says, you haven't drawn near to a mountain touched and scorched, etc. So it's not like you've drawn near to a physical space. You're, being, you're drawing near to something above and beyond all that. He says, and including the mediator of the, the renewal of the covenant, which comes at the wedding feast. Okay, we're not, that, that renewing of the covenant is, was just like at Mount Sinai. The covenant was done as a cohesive group at the mountain. I don't think that the covenant thing is going to be done individually. When do you ever see the covenant thing done individually? Well, you see it obviously with Abraham and that when it was just one person. But once there's a group, when do you see him covenanting with a lot of people in the group all one at a time or 10 at a time or five at a time? No, they're all going to come together and covenant together. And he's the mediator of that covenant. Okay? So that's what, that's my, you know, my very fast look at Hebrews 12 and try to figure that out answer. Okay? Remember, the context is the drawing near in verse 12, 22. You're drawing near to this, you're drawing near to that, you're drawing near to this, and to Yeshua, the mediator. So you're drawing near to Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, which he speaks is better than... Exactly. So take heed not to refuse the one speaking. He's saying, look, because it's in doing that, it's in, it's in taking heed that you've learned how to draw near. Okay? To these things that are coming that we're looking forward to, which goes back to Jeremiah 31, the covenant that hasn't happened yet. In Isaiah 11, 12, when he gathers the outcasts, are these people of flesh and blood? And the second second question is, and and won't won't we be turned into his likeness and have put on immortality? How does this all fit together? Okay, yes, yes, and then the millennium and kingdom teaching explains how it all puts together. Um, Yes, they are flesh, Yes, we will be changed if we are found in the so doing when he comes. Okay, those who have died in Messiah and those that are found alive in Messiah will be changed. But that doesn't change the fact that there will still be 2 billion people in the flesh still alive at that time. Not to mention all of the billions of people that as I teach in the Millennium Kingdom teaching, you know, are going to be in a resurrection where they're going to get taught Torah. And so we have two distinct groups of people in the millennium, those that have been changed in that twinkling and those that are still flesh. Okay, so you have both because if you're, if you're changed, then the, you're not really worried about, you know, the rain falling and the curses of Egypt because it's not going to affect your changed body very much. Okay, so he's not talking about it. There will be fleshly people who will then at the end of the millennium turn and go with the released Hasatan in, the, in, the, in, a, in a, that, that renewing of the Gog-Magog issue, okay? 
But if you want to know how this all plays out, that's a whole separate teaching, and a lot of that is talked about in the Millennium and Kingdom teaching. See, really, before anybody asks a question, I'm going to recommend you listen to all 500 teachings I've done, and all the answers are there. And then if you still have a question, I know you, and by the way, I know you want the quick, I can give it to you in five minutes response, but really, it needs the two hours or three hours of a teaching to make sure to make the case clearly and from Scripture.